issues. My name is Kimberly Tate Malone, and I am the coordinating librarian for Conversations on Social Issues. We're so glad that you're able to be here with us today. The library offers this series weekly because we believe it's an extension of our charge to promote the freedom of information and open exchange of ideas. So whether or not you agree with everything you hear in this room today, or read in the books on our shelves, or in the books that are available for checkout here on the whiteboard, we want everyone to have access to a wide range of viewpoints so that we can learn and grow from each other. So, we love to have students, faculty, and staff, and community members lead these sessions. So if you feel passionately about a topic, and you would like to find a space to explore and discuss that topic with the rest of the Seattle Central College community, please come talk to me, and we can get you on the schedule right, for next quarter. So at the end of this, I'll ask you to fill out a brief survey asking what you liked, how we can improve, because we want this to remain relevant and interesting for our Seattle Central College students especially, and the wider community at large. So, you'll note, again, these books up here. If you'd like to learn more about the topics that are discussed today, or possibly um, other perspectives than, that are offered today, we're happy to provide those resources for you. You can always go to the library's reference desk, the big desk in the middle of the room when you walked in, and whoever is there will be happy to find you some resources that you can use for class or personal life. All right. So today, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Ben Selesky, who's with Carbon Washington and is the King County Field Manager. So please join me in welcoming Ben. Cool, thanks everybody. Um, I apologize in advance. I'm going to kind of rush through some things and I'm probably not going to be able to answer everybody's questions as thoroughly as either of us would like just because of time. But I just want to thank everybody for being here and listening to me. And I also want to hear from you as well. I don't just want to like talk at everybody for the whole time, please. Um, so, who here has already heard of Initiative 732 or know some basic information about it? Cool. Yeah, so Initiative 732 is something that you will see on your November ballot. So ballots get mailed today. And so some about 20% of the population right now in Washington is already voting on this, basically as we speak. Um, yeah, so I-732 is an initiative to fight climate change and rein in our carbon pollution. So we were a group of basically students, citizens, professors, uh, who all basically got together and decided to put this initiative on the ballot. Um, we are a nonpartisan organization. We're not affiliated with any political party or candidate. Um, we essentially started out as a group of students at the University of Washington, sitting in a classroom, you know, about a quarter of the size of this, every single week as volunteers, trying to hold down two or three jobs at the same time, and figuring out, okay, how do we put a price on carbon? And so I'm going to be talking about how we formed, why putting a price on carbon is a central and efficient vital tool of fighting climate change. I'm going to talk about what 732 is specifically, and a little bit about our, I guess, political history and then take some questions. We'll see how fast we can get through all those things. But yeah, um, so we just gathered in a classroom like this because we uh, thought that putting a price on carbon is such an important but never really talked about way of reducing carbon emissions. Um, and so uh, it's got founded by an environmental economist named Doram Bauman. Um, he was a professor at the University of Washington, and uh, for a couple of years, since 2009, um, himself and a few people were just testing out different ballot languages to put this on the ballot. Um, and then, of course, you know, starting around 2012, 2013, we used to gather every single week, you know, more and more people, students, professors, their parents, their grandparents, all these used to show up. And, basically figure out, okay, how do we move this forward? Um, yeah, so we put it on the ballot, we filed our ballot uh, in uh, March of 2015. 2015. We amassed about 30 different volunteer chapters all over the state. So we are a basically 95% grassroots volunteer-based organization, um, and we collected 360,000 signatures to get this on the ballot. Um, so this is a, a sculpture in Berlin. And the name of the sculpture, and I always like to show this because I feel like it really reflects how I feel about climate change as an issue. 
the name of the sculpture is called World Leaders Gather to Talk About Climate Change. Um, and to me, it's just very telling about where we are right now, historically, uh, geologically, um, about where we are with climate change. And it kind of feels like those bad nightmares you have where the monster is chasing you, getting closer and closer and closer, and you're running and you can't move, and you're just, your feet are just not moving fast enough to the impending doom that is behind you. To me, that's how I feel about climate change. Like, we keep hearing the litany of horrors about all the bad things that are going to happen, and all we have to do is nothing, right? All we have to do to basically dive headfirst into the sixth extinction is nothing. Um, and so this is a really great visual illustration of like why the time to, you know, continually show up for sustainability expos and gala dinners and fundraisers and seminars and webinars, and that, that time is basically over now. Like, we need to start acting and we need to start talking to other people about climate change and not just to ourselves, right? Um, anyway, I just like showing that. Cool, so our goal of our organization is essentially to empower individual citizens to be change makers themselves, um, also to reduce carbon emissions, we're trying to fight climate change here, and also create replicable positive change, right? We are not naive to the fact that Washington State is like one half of 1% of national carbon emissions, right? We're not going to solve global climate change from Washington State, which is why whatever we do in any individual state needs to be judged on how easily and quickly replicable it is, among other criteria as well. Um, you know, the idea that Congress is going to come together and pass a national carbon tax, I'm not holding my breath anytime soon. Um, so our, our political strategy is that of, you know, the legalization of marijuana or marriage equality or $15 minimum wage, right? All three of those issues didn't even have a chance of being talked about even five, five or ten years ago nationally, right? And soon enough, state by state, they implemented their own policies and the dominoes fell. And now all three of those issues that, you know, you couldn't even talk about a while ago now have an air of inevitability towards their national implementation, right? Um, I remember when we first approached a lot of these like big environmental nonprofits, you know, as this group of students, and we asked them, we want to run a ballot initiative to collect signatures to put this carbon tax on the ballot. Do you want to help us? And the first thing that a lot of these groups said to us was, you have two million dollars? Because that's what it takes to get anything on the ballot. Of course, we had no money, we had no political connections, we didn't have anything. And we're like, okay, uh, sorry, we don't have that money. And so we just went back to the drawing board. And we just reached out to our own personal networks, we reached out to all sorts of different groups as volunteers, and we amassed what would be the state's uh, largest volunteer signature gathering force in history for anything. Um, and you know, a lot of these groups, they said to us, like, we'd be you know, impressed if you guys got 50,000 signatures. So we ended up getting 360,000 signatures for less than half of the amount of money that all the political insiders told us we had to raise, right? So I like to think of our success at this point as a kind of, you know, antidote towards the political wisdom of how policy is supposed to be made, right? Anyone can put something on the ballot if they want to. Anyone can make change if they want to. Anyway, uh, so this is talking about, time to breeze through some of this just for the time. Um, you know, I kind of alluded to it earlier, like, you have to be kind of honest about where we are as a species regarding climate change, right? We are facing an issue that basically no one has ever had to face before. And essentially, you know, we are the first generation to feel the effects of climate change and the last to do anything about it, really. You know, there is an ecological window of opportunity that exists outside of ideology, it exists outside of history, it exists outside of society, and it certainly exists outside of electoral cycles, right? Um, and, you know, delaying action on climate costs lives, and winning too slowly is the same as losing, right? We're not just up against the oil companies, we're up against the clock, and the clock, in a lot of ways, is a lot more ruthless adversary. Um, and so, this picture right there of that playground on fire, that's actually taken from uh, an area near Wenatchee, where there's just been ravaging forest fires here in Washington. So this is not some like abstract concept about waters rising, you know, in like poor countries around the world. This is happening right here in Washington State, right now. The Department of Ecology estimates that by 2020, climate change related damage to our state will cost us about $10 billion a year. This is 
wildfires, decreased snowpack, uh, the uh, depletion of shellfish and, and wildlife. Um, that, that all adds up. So that's essentially the price tag of doing nothing. Um, cool. So why put a price on carbon, right? Um, this is one of these kind of like wonky solutions that's not nearly as like sexy as blocking an oil train, but in terms of reducing emissions, it's one of the most efficient and powerful tools we have in our climate change toolbox, right? Um, every, virtually every single economist from across the political spectrum, Bernie Sanders, Barack Obama, Elon Musk, you know, they all say that a price on carbon is the most efficient way to reduce emissions in time. It's not certainly the only thing we need to do, no one's arguing that. But, um, you know, essentially if you dump garbage onto your neighbor's lawn, you're causing them damage, right? You're causing them economic damage, and you need to be held financially liable for that damage. The same thing goes when utility companies pollute coal, oil, and gas, right? They essentially get to pollute for free. Not only do they get to pollute for free, but the utility companies are required by law to provide us with the cheapest form of electricity. What is that in most cases? It's coal. And so they are legally obligated to destroy our future. And right, this is an issue that will not affect your parents, right? This is a kind of intergenerational tension of an issue, right? And so it's really been a mission of me personally and as this campaign to have young people uh, kind of spearhead this whole effort because like, you know, our parents aren't necessarily the moral stakeholders of this issue, right? We are as young people who will inherit and inhabit the future that we're referring to. Anyway, so the Energy, Energy Information Administration model shows that a $25 per, per ton tax on carbon emissions National, this is like a national uh, chart, would reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by about 80% by 2040. Um, you know, the amount of carbon reduction we need to do to achieve a livable future it needs to happen so rapidly and so fast and drastically that it's, all, it's, it's overwhelming, and I understand it. Um, but essentially, just a $25 a ton price on carbon emissions would basically, you know, it would make the utility companies and polluters actually have to be made liable for their damage. And it basically gets the economic engines in place so that we can boost up renewable energy and get rid of dirty energy as quickly of a transition as possible, right? Um, essentially, there's a lot of other things that we need to do besides just putting a price on carbon. You know, I'm all for investing in mass transit. I'm all for, you know, investing in underinvested communities. I'm all for, you know, doing a lot of things besides just putting a price on carbon. But in the absence of a carbon price, Every single thing that we do to fight climate change would be like trying to run up an escalator that's moving down, right? Our entire economic trajectory is based on artificially cheap fossil fuels, right? That we are going to have to pay the price for, one way or the other. Um, anyway, so this line right here, this is like business as usual, right? This is us doing nothing, our carbon emissions go up. This is a $10 ton tax on carbon emissions. This is a $25 per ton tax on carbon emissions. Um, so when I say per ton, what I mean is that translates to about an extra 20 cents per gallon of gasoline, something like that. Um, anyway, so British Columbia, since 2008, has kind of quietly implemented the world's most powerful carbon reduction policy. Um, you know, economists, policymakers, now both political parties, or all political parties in BC uh, are in favor of it. and. Uh, Basically, this is what it looks like. So they put a price on fossil fuels, right? But the thing about if you just put a price on, on, on pollution and nothing else, they're gonna pass that cost on down to the consumers, right? But we understand that just putting a price on carbon, the whole point is to make dirty energy more expensive, right? But the problem is, okay, we don't wanna fight climate change on the backs of low-income people, right? Who suddenly now have to pay more of their income on increased energy prices. Right? So one model of like how to basically get around this is a called, something called revenue neutral carbon taxes. Where essentially you raise a bunch of money from the carbon tax and use the revenue um, to essentially offset or reduce existing taxes. So this is British Columbia, they raise about $5 billion a year and they use the majority of that revenue uh, to reduce personal and business income taxes. And there's also like an offset for low income families as well. Um, so this is the results of that experiment. Sales of refined petroleum products per capita is down by about 17% in British Columbia, while they're up everywhere else in Canada as a whole. 
Um, and you know, this, this thing that like conservatives or a lot of people say, it's like, oh, you have to choose between the environment and the economy. That's a false choice, right? British Columbia's economy as of right now is actually outperforming Canada as a whole. And so I like to think of British Columbia's example as like an example of something that works, right? This is not a theoretical exercise. This is not a bunch of people together in a room talking about a thousand what if policies, right? Um, you know, creating policies that can't get enacted don't reduce carbon emissions, right? British Columbia is a real world example, right? Washington State is not going to be the guinea pig here. Um, anyway, so this is what a revenue neutral carbon tax would look like in Washington State. So we put a $25 per ton on carbon emissions. Now, the, the utility companies and refineries are the place where this tax will actually be placed. So the tax itself is going to be placed pretty far upstream. Um, but we also expect and understand that some of that cost will be passed on down to the consumers. And we have to be aware of that. Um, so we are using the majority of this revenue to reduce our state sales tax by one percentage point. It may not sound like much, but you know, nickels and dimes add up over the year. That 1% reduction in sales taxes saves the average family a couple hundred dollars a year. Um, so we raise about $2.2 billion of revenue with this, and I'll show you like a visual graph in a second. Um, so the majority of the tax revenue will be used to reduce our state sales tax. A, because we're trying to re you know, reduce the regressivity of Washington State's tax system, which is the most unfair in the nation, and I'll get back to that in a second. Um, but we're also trying to essentially make families whole again, right? We're, the idea being that if we put, if we make things that we want less of more expensive, we can afford to make things that we want more of less expensive. Does that make sense? <laughs> tax the things that we are trying to get rid of while taking the tax burden off of things that we want, like sales and income and investment, right? Um, we also identified two sectors of the population that might be disproportionately hurt by increased energy prices. And that is energy-intensive manufacturers that are that have to essentially trade with other manufacturers in different states that don't have a carbon tax. So we're essentially eliminating their B&O taxes, which is like a taxes on receipts, so that they'll have to pay for their pollution instead, right? You know, our, our goal here is not to kick manufacturers out of Washington, right? What that would do is that would like, you know, get rid of thousands of living wage jobs, and we would stop the pollution because they'd just be polluting in Oregon or in Idaho. Um, and we're also funding and increasing the working families rebate. Um, this is like a state level bump up of a federal program called the Earned Income Tax Credit. It's one of the biggest anti-poverty programs in the nation. And essentially with this uh, working families rebate, we uh, would be giving up to $1,500 a year to 460,000 low income families in Washington. This is essentially the biggest anti-poverty program that Washington State has uh, enacted in decades. But the funny part about this is that this is actually already a law here. It was passed in 2008 by Governor Gregoire, but it was never ever funded. So we have this great anti-poverty program sitting on the books, but no checks ever go out to these families. So we are fully funding this pre-existing law and increasing the money we give them by about 25%. So yeah, the idea being is that we're trying to create you know, change that makes our tax code fairer, that you know, fights economic inequality, that reduces carbon emissions and can have a chance to be bipartisan, right? Like it or not, if we want to have national carbon pricing or national climate action, we're going to have to need some conservatives, right? Climate, or climate change is one of the most politically polarized issues of anything, right? And so that's part of why there's been such a political and policy gridlock, both locally and nationally on this issue. Anyway, so here's like a visual representation of what I-732 would do. So one of the most common questions I get is, okay, well this sounds good enough, but I mean, why don't we use some of that revenue to do all these other things, right? There's a great, awesome list of things that we could use 2.2 billion dollars for, right? Investing in transit, investing in you know uh, other invested communities, and, and uh, putting the money towards research and development into renewable energy, right? All those things, like ideologically, I'm totally for. Like that sounds great, but. There are good reasons about you know, using the tax revenue to offset existing taxes. A, like I said, carbon pricing is an inherently regressive revenue source, right? So if we use this money to invest in whatever project or research and development that we wanted, that would be great itself, but 
the people that would be paying the majority of their income for those programs are low income people, right? Who spend the majority, or who spend the biggest percentage of their income on energy, right? Um, and so, you know, we don't want to place the, the burden of the cost on low income people. That's kind of the line in the sand that we, that we drew in this policy. Uh, tax increases are hard politically, right? Uh, Washington State has never had an example of a, of, a, of a tax increase ever being passed on the ballot, right? Like I said before, a great carbon pricing policy that can't get passed won't reduce carbon emissions, right? Um, and like I said before, also, revenue neutrality does allow for bipartisan support. So currently, I-732, you know, we have a lot of support uh, from the Democratic Party, as we expected, right? But we also have a pretty impressive handful of sitting Republicans who have endorsed us as well. And so, to me, you know, that actually does kind of give me hope. A, in saying that, oh, not all Republicans are climate deniers, and that, you know, they just want a policy that, you know, will reduce carbon emissions, but in a way that doesn't expand government. Great, you know? Um, and so, it really kind of clears the path for other national action to happen, right? Um, and we also have people on the left, too, who have endorsed us as well. I don't know if you guys saw the, the stranger just endorsed us yesterday. Um, and we have this wonderful Seattle Weekly cover, DO SOMETHING! Oh yes, on 732. And, and 11 other ways to make the world a better place. Um, I'm sorry, can you quickly define what uh, revenue neutral means? Yeah, it means that the, the state, we're not increasing how much we tax, we're just changing what we tax, right? So we're not increasing state revenue, we're not decreasing state revenue, we're just shifting one thing for another. We're essentially replacing part of our sales tax with a carbon tax. Yeah, um, it's kind of like a wonky economic term that I honestly don't like using very much just because it doesn't really mean anything to most people, including me before this. Um, but the most, I think, dramatic reason why we can use this revenue to reduce existing taxes, especially here in Washington State, is because we can improve the fairness of Washington State's tax code. Like I said, Washington State has the most unfair tax code in the nation, worse than Alabama or Mississippi or, or wherever, you know, here in progressive Washington. Um, what that means is because we have sales tax, we don't have an income tax. Sales taxes hurt low-income families and they essentially reward the richest people, right? So I'll, I'll show you what I mean when I say that we have the most unfair tax code in the United States. So this is a sort of different bracket of different income groups in Oregon. And this is the percentage of their disposable income that they pay in state taxes, right? So this is the bottom 20%, second 20%, middle 20%, all the way up to the top richest 1% in Oregon. These are all the percentage of their incomes that they pay in state taxes. Now, we could probably have a whole separate conversation about, you know, maybe they should pay more and they should definitely pay less, but it looks like here, more or less, everybody kind of pays around the same rate. Everybody, no matter what income group you're in, roughly you pay about 7% of your income on state taxes. Um, same thing goes in Idaho, right? There's a little bit of fluctuation here and there, but roughly every single income group, from the richest to the poorest, pay roughly about 7% of their income on taxes. This is California. Once again, a little bit more in the top and the bottom, but. Once again, roughly everybody pays kind of the same rate of around 9 or 10% of their income on taxes. This is Washington State. So, as you can see, it's completely upside down. Um, look at this, the top 1% pays barely 2.5% of their disposable income on taxes. Think of how many rich people we have in, in Seattle, right? Um, and as you can see, the lowest 20%, and even, even the middle, like, they get killed by our tax system. It's, it's incredible, honestly, um, that we sort of put up with this in the state. Um, and so this is the main reason why, you know, increasing, increasing state revenue through a carbon tax, while the programs that they go to are good in themselves, like that would just make these, you know, these income groups tax burden increase even more. And that's something that we just don't want to do. Um, so this is the effect of I-732. Um, on a um, low-income family with one child. So as you can see, we are slashing their tax burdens a lot. And how the earned income tax credit is working family family rebate, like I mentioned, how it works is essentially the more kids you have, the more money you get from the government, right? Um, 
And so if this, I don't have the second slide, but there's one that says if you have two kids, if you have three kids, this just keeps going down more and more and more, right? Um, and so we're essentially cutting their tax burden in, in half, right? Um, and so, you know, this is the most progressive change to Washington State's tax system in 40 years. Um, anyway, so throughout this campaign, we've always wanted to use transparency as a weapon, honestly. Uh, this is a carbon tax calculator that the, the computer science division at the University of Washington made specifically for this policy. So you can actually calculate you know, your zip code, your annual income, roughly how much you spend on gas, and it'll calculate how much you'll spend on carbon taxes and how much you'll save on tax reductions. And so I've diffused so many heated arguments you know, by saying, listen, go online to our carbon tax calculator, there's even one for small businesses as well, um, and see how you're gonna come out, because I guarantee you, you might be surprised, right? I don't spend that much money on things, I drive around a lot, I'm, I, I'm basically low income, and I end up saving about 25 bucks a year for this policy. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's one of these things where in this day and age it's really easy to talk about issues you care about only with people who agree with you. I'll tell you, after spending the past two years of my life knocking on doors and calling voters up and just talking to the general public, you know, um, you really do kind of have to meet people where they're at, right? You know, it, like, you have to be prepared to walk into any neighborhood anywhere in the state of Washington, knock on the door, and be prepared to face whatever ideology is on the other side of that door. And that's what we are trying to do with this initiative, is talk to the electorate, doing something that a lot of other environmental groups kind of forgot about. Um, cool, so why are we doing this now in 2016? Well, for a few good reasons. A, we have you know, science-based goals that we're trying to hit, right? We have about five years left to achieve the emission targets that we need to to maintain the you know 1.5 degrees Celsius limit that the Paris Agreement uh, said that we need to aim for. That's going to be really really hard, almost impossible. But essentially, you know, we don't have time to wait. Um, also, it's a presidential election. In case anyone hasn't noticed, um, you know, high voter turnout in presidential elections um, really 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 uh, can carry these types of climate policies to victory, right? We're not going to be able to do this again in 2018. The electorate is just not going to be right. It's going to be a conservative backlash against Hillary Clinton, hopefully. Um, and essentially, the next opportunity that we're going to get to do something this big on climate won't happen until 2020. I don't know about you, but I don't want to wait that long. We certainly can't afford to wait that long. Um, yeah, and essentially, you know, I, I, I don't know about all of your experiences. I'd be curious to know, but you know, I spent a lot of time you know, in doing protests and, you know, blocking oil trains and, you know, the Keystone XL pipeline and, you know, di divestment, fossil fuel divestment campaigns. You know, those are all really great things and they should be expanded upon tenfold, right? Um, but I kind of realized at a certain point that I think the environmental movement needs to start playing some offense soon, right? We're always doing these kind of, like, stop this infrastructure project, divest my camp from fossil fuels. It's kind of whack-a-mole uh, projects where we're just trying to like get rid of each individual uh, you know, issue. And now I think it's time to really take the fight to the fossil fuel companies themselves, right? Um, and for the first time, we want to have them be financially liable for their damage, right? The, the idea being that the way to get less pollution is to make pollution expensive. And so with I-732, we're trying to Reduce, pol reduce pollution, um, make our tax system more fair, and create easily replicable change through a policy that you know anyone can be a part of, right? Um, and uh, yeah, this took, we still have a lot of time. So at this point, I know I breezed through a lot of stuff, but I'd be happy to take questions at this point, either about the policy, the politics, anything that you want to talk about. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, you're lowering taxes for the lower income individuals here, citizens in in our district or in our state. Statewide. Statewide. Uh, though, upon having the federal taxes, where is the monies from certain continental other remedies? Where are they? How are, how should we pay for our buildings or our roads if we minimize? And it, it is a great idea for another person to thrive, though as well as having as well as you know, 
foundation within our communities as well. Uh, I think I understand. Are you, are you saying cool. that you're worried that we're... We won't have enough money to right. pay for our roads. Uh, for instance, we're building a tunnel um, near the water with Big Bertha. Yeah. And of course, our taxes we're, from our employers, we pay you know, money out of our paychecks that goes to the roads that are being built yeah. and the tunnels being built. Yeah. I'm uh, not sure if you... Right, no, no. I mean, this, this will not decrease the amount of state taxes that we have. I also agree with you that like the state in general like just needs more money, right? Like that's a huge problem, and I, I personally I think we should have an income tax. We should have capital gains tax. You know, I mean that's like, as soon as that initiative goes goes by, like I'll be the first person to sign up to help for that. Um, so yeah, I mean we have problems on top of problems, and we have risks in in every direction, right? So you know, um, I this policy as written will do more to reduce carbon emissions than any other policy in North America, right? But I also agree, like, you know, we also need... No, it's think, amazing. Yeah, the yeah. Tax and carbons, most of them. Yeah, 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 no, but I mean, that, that, that's, that's a good... Lowering taxes, though. You know, yeah. And we're, we're, we are lowering taxes for everybody, like, because of the sales taxes, um, but we're also, you know, it just kind of balances out. Well, it's just like taxes. having a uh, having balance. Yeah. I was just curious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're essentially trying to make it so that, you know, if you have a private jet and you own a Hummer, like, yeah, you'll probably be about $800 behind at the yeah. end of the year. Um, if you're, like, a middle-income group, you'll probably be about the same. And if you're on the lower 40%, you'll actually be helped out a lot, right? Oh. Yeah. So what about the main opposition I read, the weekly just sort about this, but the, the, the cut of business and occupation tax, so we were saying Boeing is going to end up less taxes if this passes, then yeah. they are not. Yeah, definitely. So there's been a lot of criticisms toward this this initiative. Some is warranted. Some I think is unfair. Obviously, there's you know a lot of people with a lot of different opinions. Um, I think the only actual policy blemish that I could think of is what you brought up. Um, but I guess I have a few responses to that. And um, so this is what you what I think you're referring to is the Boeing tax break. Is it the Boeing tax break? Yeah. Um, so part of the business and occupation tax reductions, um, you know, they essentially reduce uh, business and occupation taxes on energy intensive manufacturers. Like not all businesses, but just on manufacturers. Now Boeing, because our legislature, you know, has basically been giving Boeing these tax breaks year after year, these ridiculous tax breaks. Um, Boeing, as I understand it, has this choice where they can either pay B&O taxes or sales taxes. Um, and so, because of that, they get like a little bit of extra money than they otherwise would have. Um, so, yeah, it's not, if I could like go back, I'd probably change that. However, there's been a lot of discussions about whether we could have had anything to like fix that at all. Because that's something the legislature did years ago, right? So, you know, putting the problems that the legislature did at the feet of a climate initiative, it's kind of like a case of barking up the wrong tree, right? Like, I think the legislature should patch up, you know, all those tax breaks that you have going. Because, like you saw, you know, like, the rich people don't pay anything, basically. Um, and so, I, I, I doubt that there's that much that we could have done to fix that. Um, but in terms of, you know, there's no such thing as the perfect policy, right? In the article that the stranger wrote that endorsed us, they made the reference to the marijuana initiative, right? 502, right? You know, there was major problems with that initiative, right? In fact, a lot of the opposition from the marijuana initiative came from me uh, marijuana, medical marijuana patients who, you know, were concerned that, you know, law enforcement, you know, pulling them over, there wouldn't be any protections for that, you know? And that's a serious problem, and I want to help fix that. But I think we're all in agreement that we are a lot better off having passed that than waited indefinitely for something else, right? Um, so, yeah, keep in mind also Boeing is also going to be paying millions of dollars in carbon taxes, right? I mean, how much carbon do they use every single year, right? So our tax will be covering all their pollution. Um, but yeah, I mean, that is a good point that you brought up. So, yeah. Yeah. So if this um, initiative is passed, what else are you going to do about climate change? Are you going to try doing more initiatives or? That's a really good question. Um, I don't know. I feel like the legislature is just so 
gridlocks, like indefinite gridlock, that I feel like the only way to break through the stalemate, we've kind of seen this nationally where President Obama, you know, he just throws his hands up and he's like, all right, I'll just do an executive order. You know, I'm not going to work with Congress because I can't get any work done. I think going through the initiative process and going through executive orders are kind of the only two politically open roads that I see, right? Um, I mean, you know, Governor Inslee's uh, clean air rule that he just released, like that's gonna be tied up in court for years before anything happens, right? Sound Transit 3, I think it's great. I'm gonna vote yes on it, but you know, it'll be 25 years till we start seeing carbon reductions, right? We don't have that much time. Um, so ballot initiatives are, are really good. Um, there's obviously, you know, issues with it. It's kind of in the absence of congressional activity, ballot initiatives necessarily kind of have to step in and pick up some of the slack that legislators in Olympia are doing. Um, so this was actually an initiative to the legislature. The picture that you're seeing in back of me, that is us turning in our signatures in Olympia. Um, so essentially, the legislature had an opportunity in January of this year to actually just pass this outright. So they could have you know, passed it outright, they could have um, proposed an alternative and put both the alternative and this one on the ballot for November. Um, or they could just ignore it and do nothing and it'll go on the ballot. They chose option number three. Um, so, you know, they had an opportunity to have this in their hands. And so a lot of people who don't like the initiative process for whatever reason, they keep saying, oh, we need the legislature to do this. The legislature is the right group of people to have this done, right? And I'm like, well, A, this was in front of the legislature. We put it on their lap and they still punted, you know? Um, so, you know, we have to use as many political channels as we can, both Official actors and unofficial actors need to jump on board. Yeah. Uh, in presidential case, like if the Donald Trump became the president, so he would be agreeing the carbon tax. And Donald Trump's president, he would what? Yeah, yeah like he would be agreeing the carbon tax because he he, he doesn't believe in uh, climate change. Yeah, uh, if he's elected president, among many other problems, would be, yeah, uh, we would have, but he says he wants to like get rid of, of the Paris Agreements, right? And, you know, add that to the list of scary things. But uh, yeah, no, he, he would probably not like this. Yeah, yeah. so vote. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Are there projections for how this will turn out? Like polling numbers, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, so we, we've had a few sort of arrays of, of, of polling numbers. Um, so I'll spill the beans and say that, you know, the first carbon tax in the nation is not going to be a slam dunk, right? It's going to be close, right? I'm going to be honest with you. We're either going to win or we're going to lose by a little bit. Um, there's been, let's see, polling by the Northwest Progressive Institute had us at around 54% statewide. Um, remember, all we need to win is 50% plus one. Right? That's around a little bit more than 2 million votes, if the 4 million votes total holds up in 2012. Um, and uh, let's see, we just moved, we were originally at like, it was like one third, one third, one third, yes, no, undecided. There's a lot of undecided voters out there, mostly just because they still haven't heard of this yet, right? There's probably a million climate concerned voters out there who have no idea this is even on their ballots. And so, I mean, that's part of the challenges of being like a grassroots organization with, you know, a little funding, you know, is that we just don't have the resources uh, that a lot of other groups do to get our message out there. But, you know, we're getting it out there, basically, having one conversation at a time, um, spreading it on social media and all that. Um, so we were at one third, one third, one third. Uh, about a month ago, another poll came out that had us move up about eight points. Um, so we're polling at around like 47% yes in that poll, and about 38% no, and but still a lot of people undecided. So, um, you know, we're moving forward in our polling where the opposition is staying where they are, so that's really encouraging. But, you know, um, it's gonna be close, so yeah. Yeah. I'm just wondering how you're using potential um, supporters to you know, spread that message, so via social media or whatever, I mean, yeah. how can people that are you know, behind this help? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Uh, <laughs> if you want to help get involved, now essentially, ballots get mailed today, right? So 
if there ever was a better window of opportunity to act on climate, you know, I, I don't know. This is this is pretty close, right? If acting on climate change is like a window of opportunity, this is a window of opportunity within that window of opportunity, right? We're not going to get another chance to do this until four years from now. Um, if you want to help us get involved in the next seven days, please sign up here. We do like phone bankings in our office, calling voters and you know putting pamphlets around is probably the most efficient way at this point we can get the word out. Besides, of course, social media, right? So just whether you want to come and join us phone banking or not in our office, if everybody here, you know, if you're in favor of this, we need every single person here to tell seven people about I-732, right? Um, and so, by doing that, we'll spread the message, and I think hearing positive messages about things from your friends is a lot more powerful than getting a pamphlet from a stranger, right? Um, and, you know, posting it on social media, getting it around social media, honestly, Facebook kind of is the news source for a lot of people. Um, and so, you know, posting things on Facebook and telling seven people that you know about I-732, that's what I want everyone here to do. If you if you are in favor of acting on climate, right? Um, we also have phone banks in our office. Uh, every weekday from 4 to 7.30, we have pizza, we have food, we have all sorts of volunteers come hang out with us. And on the weekends, we have like phone banking brunches in our office from 11, anywhere between 11 to 2 p.m. So our office is in Fremont near Gasworks Park. Um, if you want to help get involved, sign up and I'll let you know, or you can just show up, honestly. Um, if you don't want a phone bank, we can send you to go flyering. There's so many things that we need help with. And it all needs to happen in the next mm, maybe eight days, right? I'd say we have until October 27th. Um, and then after that point, most people will have probably voted and the things that we're going to be needing to do might shift a little. But, you know, <laughs> urgency. <laughs> yeah. Uh, someone had, yeah. Um, I guess, is the, was the BC... British Columbia um, success also a carbon tax? Yes, yeah, yeah. Although one thing that is one flaw in British Columbia's carbon tax that we improved upon in 732, uh, besides just like giving more tax credits to low-income families, is that uh, British Columbia's carbon tax actually capped at $30 per ton in 2012, I believe. Um, so their emissions have actually flatlined a little bit and are actually slightly going up because you know you have to account for the fact that emissions are going to keep are going to be going down, right? And economic growth will keep on happening. Um, so unless you keep on steadily rising the price of carbon, um, your emissions are not going to go down, right? So I seven thirty two puts twenty five dollar tax twenty five dollar ton tax on carbon emissions. But it also increases by around three to five percent every single year to account for economic growth, inflation, and with the expectation that emissions will go down. But we need to keep the pressure on, also to maintain revenue neutrality. Right? We need to keep revenue from coming to the state. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you said like it can go from twenty-five dollars per ton, and then it can continue rising. Correct. So how? What's going to stop them from just passing? into their prices like like passing the costs on down to yeah us. yeah i mean nothing like nothing's going to stop that. that's what that's what we, have, we should expect them to do we have a cut for the b and o but if you're like a construction company and you own a bunch of trucks and you have to balance in how much it costs you to use all your equipment your bids are obviously going to go higher yeah, and your, sales, yeah and, and your sales taxes will go down by a lot you know Businesses actually pay a third of the state sales taxes there. So, I mean, that's a totally valid concern. Um, but I think, I don't know if there's a specific company you're thinking of, you know. Well, I just work for a lot of construction companies. I just know that that's part of your bid is how much it costs you to travel and do it. So. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, uh, I, I think there's, there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of worry out there. I mean, I think, like you said, there's risks everywhere we do, right? There's a risk of doing nothing. There's a risk of doing the wrong way. There's risks of doing a great carbon reduction policy, but also, you know, doesn't account for what you're talking about, right? You said there'd be a lot of inflation in those sectors. Like, the prices are obviously going to go up for those kind of jobs. Mm, in, like fuel, you have, in fuel, by a little bit. Now, keep in mind, like, the, the tax increases and reductions, like, this is not going to be, we're not going to be shipping things overnight. We're not going to be shipping things even in a year, right? These are like 
tiny, tiny incremental changes. And keep in mind, like, the idea being is that our transportation situation, our energy situation is going to look dramatically different in even just 10 years from now, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the issues that we're talking about, it's like, well, like, I need fossil fuel to get to work, da, 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 da. you know, like, those things are actually going to go away in the next 10 years because of, you know, green technology and innovation and, um, you know, just things are going to be changing uh, because of the way we're moving. Um, but, yeah, you know, once again, it didn't solve every problem, but we did it in a way that is both simple, transparent, and, you know, doesn't hurt the economy. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just curious. I mean, you've been dealing with a lot of policymakers and stuff. Like, if this thing passes, how set in stone is it? Like, do you see any backlash? Do you see any, like, more opposition from after this? Passes? After, if it passes, do you yeah. see any, like. So, the only example I can think of is what happened in British Columbia, right? Um, for I 732, you'll notice two kinds of, of, like, arguments against it, right? The, the people that say this is doing too much, oh my god, oh my god, increased gas prices, and the people that say it doesn't do enough. Like, no, a carbon tax alone is not going to do anything. We need to do this, 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 you know? Um, I'm not in disagreement with that. I am just in disagreement that the way to get more things done is to not do anything, right? <laughs> um, so in British Columbia, the people that came out against it, um, I think two years later, uh, was actually the, uh, it's like the party of, like, the left, they call it like the Liberal Party, but they're more on the left. Um, in uh, British Columbia, they ran their campaigns on like an Axe the Tax uh, platform, um, and then the tax remains in place, and it's now supported by all political parties in British Columbia. So I think you see this with, with a lot of new things coming to the table. There's a lot of, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, it's going to do this, it's going to do that, we need to do this, and then it passes, and the sky doesn't fall, and everyone's okay, right? Mm -hmm. And you saw that with all sorts of different. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I guess we'll see. Yeah. I'm, I'm so sorry. I lack knowledge. So, carbon. Uh, there's many certain types of carbon, mm -hmm. right? So, I, I imagine there's carbon in cigarettes, carbon in the air, natural carbon free, uh, as well as carbon gases with any emissions. And uh, that's the worst, the emissions. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious. Within certain contracts, uh, I suppose it's kind of far-fetched. It's very, very, very broad, and it's sort of opening a, a window where I don't know if you can really trot through it. But I, I imagine within contracts, it is it is illegal to have. It's like placing somebody in a. You can't have a bunch of carbon, and, and it's, it's okay. For instance, when you park a car, you can't park a car backwards if you're if you're in an apartment where your your exhaust pipe is facing their window. Yeah. Similar, and I suppose when you when you approach the matter, and I suppose I, I suppose I'm just making sure there's different types of carbon. Yeah. Because I, um, you imagine you're like, why is this not legal? This is absurd. Yeah. So so I suppose I'm just stating when when approached with the matter. Uh, How do we decide? Yeah, because there'll be a lot of things thrown yeah. at you. That's like, a great great question. So yeah, yeah. how do you approach? Yeah. yeah. So. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of the backlash from the right, you know, is going to be like, we're trying to tax what I breathe, you know, it's because it's, uh, yeah, I mean, we all breathe carbon, right? Carbon is a part of life. If we don't have carbon, we'd all die, right? right. Um, you know, just like that said, like, water is a part of life, and, like, if we wouldn't have that, we would also die. But I wouldn't want to be, you know, stuck in a, in a room where there, I can't, where right. there's too much water, right? That's kind of the same thing. You would have to have a ton of carbon yeah, in your room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so coal, oil, and gas, that is burned in the state of Washington is the only thing that is covered, right? So um, I know like methane, for example, it's another really powerful yes. greenhouse gas and it yeah. comes from cows, right? That I really think we should do something about methane. Washington state doesn't really have a huge methane problem. I mean, I know natural gas, that's kind of an issue with natural gas um, that definitely needs to be fixed. Um, but Washington state doesn't have a huge um, uh, like beef industry necessarily. So that's not a huge issue. This covers about 95% of all it's huge. carbon emissions. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. So just coal, oil, and gas for the state of Washington. Um, and how we get that is from the fuel mix disclosure reports that the utility companies are required to submit every single year. 
So they say how much of their fuel mix was from hydro and how much was it from coal, right? Okay. And we actually had a provision in this initiative where if the utility companies say unspecified, like, well, we don't really know where we're getting our, our power from, because that is true. Like, it's kind of hard to specify sometimes. If they say unspecified as a way of getting around the tax, we tax them all like it's all coal, right? And so part of what we're trying to do is to just get the utility companies to be more transparent about where they're getting their energy, right? Yeah. We know Washington has a lot of hydro, so show us, you know, right. that's kind of what we're trying to do. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, obviously, Uh, like in terms of measuring how we're doing as far as emissions reduction? Or uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we definitely are. I am certainly not the expert on that. I, I will not be the person that is, is looking at those metrics. Um, uh, it's, we are looking at... Um, well, so we should... We are expecting around about, I think, 2% emissions reductions per year from this. Um, which will get us, I think, about 70 to 80 percent of the way there to meet Washington's emissions reduction targets. That, you know, like I said, there's a lot of talk out there about, you know, oh, we are going to proclaim that we have these emission targets, right? In like 2008, um, you know, we, that's what Washington State had is we are going to get this level of emission reductions by 2030, right? Which is great, except they had no mechanism in place to actually enforce it, right? Um, and so I think one of the most interesting things that I learned on this campaign is kind of the really sharp contrast between like proclamations and like actual measurable, quantifiable, verifiable change, right? Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get you more information though if you want to know exactly like all the, the, the measurements that we're using to calculate how successful we are. And if this passes, Carbon Washington as an organization will stick around and essentially make sure that this policy is enacted in the way that it's going to Thank you so much for your time and attention. I've passed out surveys. Please return those to me. And I also want to let everyone know that we have voter pamphlets in English, Spanish, Vietnamese, and Chinese. So if you are a registered voter or planning to register to vote in person, which you can do until October 31st, then please go ahead and pick one of these up. Learn more about this initiative and the other initiatives that are on our ballot this uh, year. And thank